Hi. Hello. Hi. The first thing I want to hear is I want to hear about you opening for Merle. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was so is cool. Is that the craziest? Did you see that? I saw I, that. I was like, you know, that we, is so cool. We had a day off and I and we had played in Naples, Florida. And I happened to see somebody post online. I went to a Merle show and I said, oh, he must be in Florida. And so I looked at his schedule and sure enough, he was at the Villages in Florida. And I went to buy tickets, sold out. And I was like, I'm so, I was so disappointed. We were supposed to have pl- have recorded at Jimmy Buffett's studio that next day. It's illegal to park a bus in Key West. And they sub- they won't even let Jimmy Buffett park his bus there. So we can't go to Key West. There's no place to park. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just so distraught. Can't get Merle tickets. Can't go to Key West. Laid down and I said, oh, um, I think, see Merle Haggard's, driver came to our show about four or five years ago and I woke up at 1 30 in the morning and I looked through my phone and sure enough his number was in there I text him I said Ronda Vince of the Rage we're in Florida try to buy tickets they're sold out we'd give anything to open a show for Merle Haggard and do you, and he texts back and he said I'll talk to the old man and call you in the morning <laughs> and I knew if we had I could have at that point told the driver to drive there just like in case but I said if we do that well that'll jinx it nothing will happen so I didn't tell I didn't say a word to anybody no one knew and at 10 o'clock the next morning sure enough he called he said Merle said come on we're five hours away and I have to wake up my bass player who is our second driver and he I said Mickey we're going to open for Merle Haggard tonight. I need you to I need you to drive <laughs> us there now. Yeah, so he just basically w- got out of bed, got in the driver's seat, no food, no coffee, and just drove as fast as he could get us up there. We arrived right as Merle is doing his sound check. And then we were to sound check right after. So we just made it. It was such an amazing experience. I got yeah. to I'm sitting on Merle's bus visiting with you know it's like this most surreal experience because mm-hmm. do you you don't ever expect to just be sitting here having a conversation with Merle Haggard somebody that I have known of since I was a little girl and admired him so much and then to watch a show to open for him his entire band was watching our show and and the one of the guys came over afterwards and he goes I want you to know we don't watch any of the openers we don't watch anybody Every one of our band members was out watching you guys. And it's like, that is so cool. And Merle watched our entire sound check and Wonderful. he and his wife. So, yeah, it was. And then he just they just recently called. They want us to open shows. He's got he said, I have a couple of songs for you. Um, but I, oh, wow. it's like, like he writes every day. Yeah. It's like I didn't know. Willie said Willie writes every day, too. And, and he just looked at he said, I got a couple of songs for you. But it's like, how do I get those? I don't know. I'm going to have to call his wife, aren't I? Say so where's yeah. the, where's the songs? But um, How about those songs? About those two songs, and you know, I don't I don't know how he records them or how he does that. But uh, I was just really it was a, just an amazing experience for us. Yeah, yeah, I bet I saw that release and I was like, oh wow, that is <laughs> ever. I just love that, and I love that you had that initial idea of I'm just going to buy tickets. I'm a fan. Oh yeah. You know, rather than let me call my people. Oh and- no, you know what? We're, we support the music, you know, so we always buy, I go to things here in Nashville and then I'm the buddies and I'll go sing with 45 RPM, you know, so we'll put you on the guest yeah. list. It's like, no, I, I'm going to, even though I'm singing, I'm here to buy a ticket. I'm a fan of this. I yeah. love, I get so much enjoyment out of that. You know, I love that. And so. also you want that to continue. You want to oh, be able yes. for them to continue to doing the 45 RPM. Yes. Oh yeah. You want to support the show. Yeah. So it's, it's really good. And that was just the excitement of, as everyone woke up the next morning, you know, Mickey's driving and before I, cause I wanted to be the one to tell everybody, you know, Hey, we're going <laughs> to, and uh, before I could, somebody else would blur out, Hey, we're opening for Merle Haggard tonight. Hey, we're every, <laughs> with every person that woke up from bunk to bunk. It did very, very quickly. <laughs> very cool. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be spending the majority of the year talking to people about success and happiness. Uh-huh. What is your working definition of success? Um, success. I heard Charlie Daniels doing an interview, and he really signified what success is for me. Uh, and I and I st- have stolen that from him because he said his uh, one of his greatest accomplishments is keeping about 25, 30 people gainfully employed for over 40 years. Yeah. 
And that is, and I look at that, I have the longevity in the musicians. I have a fiddle player, a bass player that's been here 14 years. And so we're on our way to there. I, I really hope, um, you know, that's, to me, that is success. I think also success is waking up each day and never knowing what, you know, we're, we perform, but on a day off that we get to open for Merle Haggard. Yes. That's success. Opening for George Jones, for Alan Jackson, and just these relationships that you, that you get to have in music is, is so amazing. Um, the awards are all great. Uh, we performed on the Grand Ole Opry over 171 times. There's, you know, all of these landmarks mark things in in our lifetime but to really say true happiness i to, for me is touring continuing to tour and having these experiences a new experience each and every day a wonderful family you know true happiness oh, yeah. long after i'm not performing the real the real happiness is in my husband that we've been married over th- it'll be 32 years on christmas eve in 2015 And, you know, that's, you know, if you wanted to find happiness, that is having, you know, children that are healthy and happy and a wonderful husband. And so that's first and foremost is family. Yeah, that's in there that. And that's why I'm interested in exploring that, because I think for a lot of people, when they very first get started, and it may have been different for you because of how you got your start. Yeah. But when people are you know, living somewhere else and they're not in the music industry, but they dream of it and they come here and they tie their happiness to their success. Right. And things go wrong. Yeah. And it's it's something that I've been really interested in exploring. Is that something you've watched, you've had to watch for in your life? That you, I have experienced if, that. You know, if a record didn't quite go as well or something right. didn't come out as you thought, that it didn't affect your happiness it only affected your work life right yes and I think that's it's really hard to to separate that I think for a lot of people like you say you come you dream of this you come to Nashville and you think you know I always thought gosh if I have a a successful song or if I'm very successful in what I do that that equates to happy that doesn't necessarily some of the most miserable people that I've ever met have lots and lots of money and lots of success but they're they're not happy and, and I think uh, watching that, and I watched that early on, and I know, you know, working towards c- in country music and working in bluegrass and seeing the different, the way things work. Um, and I think the greatest way to, for me to, um, to really define that is there is, in bluegrass music, there's an authenticity. It's very real, and I think that makes it a little easier for me to probably attain that happiness because, I mean, yes, you want a successful career, but I think that you have to keep it very real. When I would go home, I live in Missouri still, but early on in my career, whenever, you know, you have managers, you have people to do everything for you, but it was important when I would go home, my, my husband would make sure the wood box was empty. <laughs> so the first thing that I had to do when I got home is go out and bring wood in yep. and you know mountains of laundry little you know I have small our daughters you know and he would make sure you know there's there's a, a jolt back into reality and I think there everyone has to have a place where you can it's like hitting reset and yep. I am I'm hitting reset and now whether I sing I play whatever my career is that is secondary to this family that's right here and and really centering yourself whether you have a family or maybe you don't have a husband but still finding that place where you can you just at some point you have to be real with yourself and to be able to say this is just me here and have I been true to myself and have I been you know uh, I want to really take a, a close evaluation of who I am have I been, you know, you can get really caught up in yeah. the music business and not treat people well. Mm-hmm. And you might not treat people good. You might not treat yourself well, or maybe you're not being treated right. You know, so, and it's important to, you have to sort that out. And I think you have to get that alone time and really, and yeah. do a, a close self-evaluation of your circumstances and everything. You know, my husband, when I was in country music, you know, we were getting groceries off credit card at, at one point. It was very, I mean, even though he worked, I mean, I could never have followed my dream if it hadn't been for my husband. He was there paying the bills. But it got, you know, we were paying money to go to Nashville and paying money for, you know, trying to pursue this career. It becomes very expensive. And, I mean, that's that story has been, I remember Jody Messina was, uh, you know, captive in that too. And she had a number one record and was yeah. on the verge of bankruptcy. And that, that comes, you know, very often because they want you to look a certain way. They want you to rent a tour bus. And you can't afford to do that at that point. 
that point. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. so you can really get into a lot of debt. And I think that's that's probably be, before happiness. I mean, you want to be happy, but number one, just budgeting and making sure that you don't get so, because that's going to lead to real unhappiness if you have to file for bankruptcy or if you're homeless or, yeah. you know, it can really lead to that. It's a very, very, it's something that's very, very serious. And the lights and the, the glitter of, of a career, no matter where it is, uh, is so appealing and you go oh my goodness I want to do that let me sign my life away yes. and then everyone you're actually working for everyone else and you're penniless so it's something real I mean I've experienced that I would not to be penniless penniless I guess but you know we've been on that verge to say Creeping let's make it yeah, yeah and you want to make that you got to look at your decisions and say am I going to continue this I guess it's almost like it's almost like gambling really you know, if you're at the yeah. crap table, yeah. you got to know when to say, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. The wisdom of Kenny <laughs> Rogers. <laughs> I want to touch on something you, um, because you straddled both bluegrass and country, and they are different worlds. It's something I, I was sort of aware of when I was still in Europe, but didn't only saw when I live, was living here, how yeah. different those worlds are. Right. But in both of those worlds, you managed to stay who you are. To what attrib- do you attribute that? Is that sort of the education you got as you were growing up? Is that personality? Can you teach somebody that? I think it's probably an ignorance that I was in a musical family and we're it's all for one and one for all. And I grew up in this musical family and then I got to a point where I came to Nashville and when they asked me to sing a song that was everything I was not, um, about drinking, about you know, um, smoking, uh, sexual innuendos, and I, and I blatantly just came out and said, I would never sing that. And that was the beginning of the end, I believe, for in country music, because I was so honest and just totally ignorant of the fact that I just upset the heads of my <laughs> career. Yeah, in country music, that's that not is how they do things around it here. Is, yeah, that's yeah, that's not how we do things around here. That's exactly right. Now they never said that to me. Mm-hmm. Um, they said okay, but I'm sure behind closed doors, it's like okay, we won't be working. She's too hard to get along with. She, we're not working. With. And it, I wasn't intending to be hard to get along with at all. I was just knew. I wouldn't. I I wouldn't sing that. I don't live that, and I don't sing that. My father always said. Um, it was always open to us. He said, if you want to smoke, if you want to drink, you want to try drugs. Yeah. Um, he said, bring it home. We'll all try it together. I never, ever wanted to do that. Because it's available. It I was. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. I get it, it was. It was. Do you think the the pressure to be a certain thing or sing a certain type of material, do you think that's especially true for female artists still? And when they have an opinion about who they want to be, it I, gets held against them because they have an opinion while female? I think more so. <laughs> yes. So I not. really think if you're female, you're not, you're not supposed to have that opinion. And I think for the males too, I think, well, now looking back, I understand it. It's a product and we're selling this product. And so for me, it was my life. It yeah. wasn't a product, about a product. I didn't understand that. And I, I look at that. Those years were my musical college years. There were five years that I did a couple of country albums and working with the best of the best. And I appreciate all of the great things that, that they did for me. They, they educated me and, and helped me in my career yet today, you know, everything. Um, but, um, and I forgot where I was going. What was the question? <laughs> the, <laughs> I got off track. Well, no, it's, we were talking about... Um, a lot of the the difference in the way the female artists oh, have the fe- that yes. different types of that different kind of pressure on them to right yes look a certain way be a certain way you know the because I often think when I when I listen to some of Miranda Lambert's material because she touches on that a lot and Brandy Clark writes a lot about that where you have songs like Mama's Broken Heart where it's yeah, I know the old generation is women should be, like, nice and quiet and yes. sit there and look pretty, but yes. that's not what we do. No. Um, and that that's still a little bit of a struggle because the people who control the industry are that generation. Right. And the new artists coming in, male and female, have to fight the established way of doing things. Yes. Oh, that's why. It's a product, yeah. and it's what they think, that they perceive the product to be. You know, it's all been, with with the, it's become so, it's a dictatorship, and they're going to dictate. And I guess, I think you just have to realize that, and if you're willing to do that, then that's okay. If you're not, 
you know, you may yeah. want to pursue a different, a different <laughs> career, and which is what I ended up doing. You know, an independent I'd, artist. And yeah. You can keep doing your own thing and accept that you're not going to be Garth Brooks, but you'll right. get to hold on to the thing that you it is that you want to do. You're not going to achieve that level of success, but you'll have the happiness. So. Well, I and I think I have the best of both worlds. My husband and I talked about this. Is that you know there with that with that extreme superstardom. You, there, you make a lot of sacrifices that you can't, Dolly Parton can't go to the mall. I really like going and walking to the mall or having a meal without somebody going, you know, hey, can I, can I get you to sign this or can I get yeah. a picture even though you're still, I mean, I've experienced that, but um, there, is a, there is a very fine line, I think, between that. So, and yes, and we, we appreciate that. We go, wow, we have, really do have the best of both worlds. We have a, a record-setting uh, tour schedule and, you know, we get to do this and attain that success, but not to the degree of, and I think... Where you what, lose your, your you, life. You do, yeah, you've lost everything. And I think the Dixie Chicks were a, a very prime example. I watched, I read an article about them saying how they, because uh, they downsized at one point because they said they were basically working to pay for all of the trucks that were out there and all of the, yeah. the audiovisual equipment. And there reaches a point, it's so big um, that you're paying for all this stuff to, to attain all this. But it's not, it's, you have to, once again, fold it up because it's not a smart budgeting decision for you. And so you yeah. have to, I guess, weigh that, you know. And at some point, you know, they always say what goes up what must come down. So there has to be that. And I think, too, being able to, you reach that pinnacle and are you going to just, are you going to, you know, hang in there? Or, are you know, it's like if I can't have this. I'm not going to do it at all. And that some people choose that too. Yes. If I cannot have, the you know, the, the, the big, big lives, stage, so, you know, yeah. I love performing it. And it doesn't matter if I'm here, you know, at the Grand Ole Opry or if I'm at home getting to perform for the folks at the nursing home. You know, I, I enjoy singing and performing it, and my happiness comes from that. Yeah. Well, I think it's the, when you do it for that long, if you're in it for any other reason than because you enjoy it, you're not going to do it that long. You nobody, know what? That's true. You will can hold on to something. For yeah, that long. that's true. That's yeah. true. The last question I've been asking a couple of people, and it's been really cool to kind of start comparing answers. A little bit more lighthearted. Which songs would you put on the soundtrack to your life? Ooh. I'm not sure. I'll have to give that some thought. What soundtrack would I put? Yeah, when you think about the experiences you've lived, what songs yeah, do you feel? Yeah, I mean, something happy and upbeat, and I, because I have just, you know, I enjoy life, so I'm going to have to think about that, I guess. I don't, what songs that people come up with? Maybe there's one that you have in mind what, for it's, me. It's everything from, uh, you know, my high school years would be ACDC. And, oh, you know, when yeah. I grew up, it was... You know, this more, you know, Otis Redding stuff. You know, uh, you know what? I guess James Taylor would be, whenever I see your smiling face, I have to smile myself. Oh, my gosh. You're wearing just so you know exactly. Yeah. What is that song? Um, your Smiling Face. Your Smiling Is it I called Your Smiling Face? It's one of my favorite songs. You know what? It's happy. Just, you telling me the title and I get a smile yeah. on my face. So I, I think that might be the that. soundtrack because it makes me feel happy when I hear yeah. it. And I love James Taylor. So, and I hope to meet him and sing with him someday. Oh, I want to hear that song. Oh. Yes. <laughs> have your people call his people. I know. I don't know how to reach him, though, but maybe. Let's make that James, happen. call me. Mm. Yeah, like Facebook. Yeah. Tweet him. I oh, I will. I don't know if he does social media. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah that's, let's make that happen. Okay. Like that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.